I finished reading this book, A Universe from Nothing, a while ago, and I wanted to offer a critique. I'll start with his basic argument that science has an explanation for why there is something rather than nothing. Um, and then I'll critique a few other things that he said about religion and philosophy and theology. So first of all, you might be wondering why you should care what I have to say. After all, Krauss is a world-renowned physicist, and I'm just a high school physics teacher. But good scholarship looks at the argument, not at the people making the argument. To brush someone aside because he's not an expert um, in one particular field, you know, and to brush aside his arguments in another, in a different field, is a logical fallacy called ad hominem. So for the first nine chapters, Krauss explains, I want to be clear about what kind of nothing I am discussing at the moment. This is the simplest version, namely empty space. For the moment, I will assume space exists with nothing at all in it and that the laws of physics also exist. This is on page 149. Um, first of all, I want to know from you, the viewer, would you say that empty space, with all of its properties and laws regarding it, is nothing? You know, I don't see how that definition matches any of the relevant definitions in the dictionary, and, and not just what Krauss assumes that Plato and Aquinas would have been okay with, which, by the way, Aquinas would not have agreed with. Krauss makes many of these mistakes assuming something about the previous philosophers, but that only reveals his own ignorance about uh, his opponents. So let's take a look at nothing. You know, the capitalization that Krauss introduces seems to imply that he's talking about some kind of ultimate nothingness or something like that. But this nothing is everywhere defined as non-being, not just empty space, um, but non-being. Space is still space. It's a thing. It has properties. You know, in the preface, uh, Krauss explains, though, that this is vague. He says that the definition of non-being is vague, but it would be very clear to any philosopher. Um, and it, later on, on page 146, he says that he argued against the definition of non-being in his preference, in his preface, but there's nothing like an argument there. He just complains that it's vague, and then later says that he made an argument. Uh, the fact is that the definition as given by philosophers is perfectly clear. It's non-existence, the absence of anything, no existing thing. The theologians of the Middle Ages, whom Krauss rails against, would have understood this very well, and they were very clear and very logical in their proceedings on topics like this. The closest thing to an argument in the preface reveals the strong bias that Krauss embodies. He simply says science should have a say in determining the definition, but really they shouldn't because the notion of nothing is a philosophical one. By the way, Krauss clearly expresses his dislike for philosophy and philosophers, but that doesn't really help him in this book because he's dealing with a philosophical topic. The fact is that nothing cannot be observed. How do you observe nothing? can't be tested or theorized about because it doesn't have any properties, it's not a thing. And there are no physical laws concerning it because it is, by definition, non-physical and not part of the natural world. Indeed, if it were part of the physical world, then it would be something. You know, I continued reading anyway to see if he did change the definition. Thankfully, he did. Later in the book, he says this on page 170. Quantum gravity not only appears to allow universes to be created from nothing, meaning in this case I emphasize the absence of space and time, it may require them. Nothing in this case, no space, no time, no anything, is unstable. This is better, but the fact is that quantum gravity is still not nothing. You know, think about this question, is, gra is quantum gravity something? Yes, it is. Otherwise, we would not be able to discuss it and have quantum field equations about it you know, if it's nothing, then it doesn't have anything to describe it, including equations, because it's not a thing. If it is something, then it's not nothing. Ultimately, then, he fails in demonstrating why there is something instead of nothing, or how a universe could be generated by itself out of nothing, truly nothing. What he does is he commits the logical fallacy of equivocation. He substitutes his own definition to make the argument work. Ultimately, Krauss does admit this. He admits to the false advertising in the subtitle. Um, he does not come close to explaining why there is something rather than nothing. Instead, he attempts and fails to explain how there is something rather than nothing. All right. Now, there are stu still a few other problems with the book. One of these is that Krauss says in parentheses 
um, in the preface that mathematics is a product of our minds, and a lot of philosophers would agree with him there. Mathematics is a set of logical relations that we've developed in our minds. But he later says that without science, definitions are just words. But if he agrees with that, then math is just a product of our minds without science, then the question is, are mathematical definitions just words? Are the laws of logic just words? He seems to refute himself here. Also in the preface and elsewhere, he establishes a set of rules for science and therefore knowledge. For him, science is the same thing as knowledge. The problem is he doesn't follow these rules in his discussion of the definition of nothing. He cites no evidence or experiment to support the definition that he gives of nothing. He just assumes it. He seems to be doing the same thing that he accuses theologians of, fixing the definition to make the argument work. This error is uh, related to a theme that comes up again and again, the, w the fact that science is the only way we can know things. That's his assumption. Um, however, the statement that science is the only way to know is itself a philosophical statement and therefore not provable by science and therefore cannot be known if the statement is true. It's a self-refuting idea and therefore has to be false. Science is not the only way to know things, but it is the best way to know scientific things. Also in the preface, he says uh, this, the definition of the first cause still leaves open the question, who created the creator? He then cites the classical analogy of the turtles all the way down. And this is a continual theme throughout the book, a lot of just kind of offhand, sarcastic comments, rather than any real good reasoning. The problem with his declaration, though, is that um, the entire point is that uh, he demonstrates a fundamental misunderstanding of theologically rigorous Christianity. The fact is that God is necessary existence. He is being itself, capital B, capital I. He is uncreated. He's not the kind of thing that has to be created. He exists from himself. Um, the Latin phrase that was used over and over, he exists a se, from himself. The whole point is that God is not the kind of thing that needs a creator. He exists necessarily. That's the kind of thing that um, serious theologians, at least, are talking about. On page 172, Krauss says that Aristotle recognized a problem with the prime mover and therefore said that stuff has just always existed. And that's not quite right. Um, Aristotle's God, or prime mover, was nothing other than thought thinking itself. Aristotle recognized that thought thinking itself doesn't create from nothing, right? It doesn't, because it's just thinking about itself, it doesn't do outward things like creating. But the fact is that it's a, it's a metaphysical technicality it's much more nuanced than what Krauss offers in this book. Another issue that Krauss seems to ignore is the fact that Aquinas and other theologians don't rely on the Big Bang for belief in God. You know, I and they believe for many reasons, um, reasons that had and continue to have little to do with science. On page 173, Krauss insists that knowledge of the Middle Ages, the knowledge that they thought they had there must re be reinterpreted according to science, but that's not difficult because much of what they said relied very little on science. Even if it is possible to get something from nothing, that does not disprove any of the other reasons philosophically rigorous believers put their trust in God. Besides, Aquinas actually assumed an eternally existing universe in his proofs of God's existence. A first moment of creation is not even assumed in his thought processes. Uh, Several times, Krauss says that we must believe in what the evidence suggests, whether we like it or not. I couldn't agree more, and there's plenty of evidence for the existence of God. And it's not just scientific evidence. You know, he's talking about scientific evidence, but that restricts everything to a very small sphere of knowledge that he doesn't even obey. Mathematics is not a part of that. Logic is not a part of that. Um, science deals with the natural world. God is supernatural and therefore necessarily beyond the reach of science. Asking for a scientific evidence of God is like asking for historical evidence of beauty in Lord of the Rings. It's the wrong discipline. On page 143, Krauss reveals a further misunderstanding on his point. He mocks Thomas Aquinas for coming to a conclusion about angels without performing a single experiment. 
The problem, of course, is that angels are not physical, so experiment is the wrong way to go about getting information about them. The only thing, uh, the only way to think about angels is logic and using what has been revealed to us, that is, revelation. On page 142, he makes an offhand comment about miracles happening so often in ancient times, but not anymore. I would argue that miracles do still happen. In fact, at Lourdes, France, just for one example, there's a whole catalog of medical files of documented miracles. They're available to, for people to go and see, and anyone who makes the claim that miracles don't happen should at least be intellectually honest enough to go and read those files, and they would have to prove why each and every one of those is not a miracle. If they cannot do that, or they refuse to do so, then they don't really have a basis for saying that miracles don't happen anymore. Towards the very end of the book, Krauss is still resorting to making naive comments about God. One thing in particular, he says, how is it possible that God could create out of nothing, not even potential existence, while ordinary matter can't do that? Is there some kind of difference in the potential, he asks. The answer is yes. God, as the ground of all being, has the potential to bring things into existence out of nothing else, only from his own being. His is a different kind of being. Again, it's not based on an experiment, because it can't be, and to ask for experimental verification demonstrates nothing more than a deep misunderstanding about the nature of religion and philosophy and science, their relationship, and reality in general. The doctrine about God is necessary because of the nature of reality, the nature of existence. I could go on, but I think that's enough. I just hope that when people read the book, they keep their critical faculties at attention instead of just accepting whatever he says on the basis of his authority.